Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Nuclear Innovation Boot Camp, the workshop before the main event. Uh, we're going to allow a couple minutes for um, attendees to come into the room, and uh, we'll get started in a couple minutes. Okay, it looks like we've got uh, a nice audience here to get started. I'm Christine King. I'm the director of the Gateway for the Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear from the Idaho National Labs. I'm very grateful for NIA asking me to moderate this session. Um, I think this is an important part of, of our nuclear ecosystem um, is the encouragement of entrepreneurship. And I'm happy here uh, to have a distinguished panel of judges uh, today. Just some logistical items um, for those that are presenting. We will, uh, when you have one minute left in your pitch, you'll see me turn your turn my camera on as a way to signal that you have one minute to wrap up. Um, use the Q&A function to, from audience members to give us uh, questions. And we will be handling questions at the end of all of the pitches. Um, we will end our day today with a discussion about with our judges, what to do after the pitch. Um, what do you do if maybe somebody didn't like your pitch? Do you ignore them or move on? Or do you keep uh, banging your head against that brick wall? Um, and with that, we will start though um, with Ray Rothrock. Ray, it's good to see you. Um, let's get started with uh, your perspective on the art of pitching. Sure, Christine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I can't see you all, but I know you're out there. I can read numbers here on the screen. So uh, I'm Ray Rothrock. Uh, just a little bit of self-introduction here. Uh, I'm a venture capitalist, and I have been for 33 years. I uh, got into the venture business with the Rockefeller family in 1988. And at Benarock for 25 years, so it's, it was quite a long career. During that time, the internet came along and energy investing came along and a few other things. My track record is uh, pretty good. I made 53 investments in 25 years. I had nine IPOs, seven wipeouts, and all the rest, uh, some sort of M&A exit. Uh, that, if you did the math, it's about 100% IRR over my lifetime. Companies that you may have heard of that I invested in as a Series A, early stage Series A investor were Cloudflare, Checkpoint, DoubleClick, Roku, Nest, Bantu, and many, many others. Uh, during the, uh, when the internet happened uh, in, the, in the early 90s, and also when the energy era of sort of came into being venture, I uh, led my firm in those activities. And in fact, Venrock uh, still has several energy investments, and I'm sitting on the board of one of those. Anyway, relevant today, uh, I saw about 10,000 pitches. I actually kept the logbook for 25 years and added it all up and uh, collected the do's and don'ts and the goods and the bads. And you, you know, as Malcolm Gladwell says in his book, you need about 10,000 hours of something to be an expert. I don't know that I'm an expert pitcher, but I'm certainly an expert listener. And uh, so let me just give you a couple of points here. What's the point of the pitch? What is the purpose? 
The purpose of the first pitch is to get invited back to the second pitch. It's really that simple. Uh, and so if you think about what does that have to look like? What does that mean? What, what do you do? So the, the first 10 minutes, first impressions are everything. So the first 10 minutes matters most of all. Your job in the first 10 minutes is to keep me in my seat, to keep me engaged and to really kind of uh, uh, tease me with, I want to know more about your idea and about you. The next 30 minutes, of course, is to inform me and impress me of what you're doing is relevant, interesting, and worthy of my time, but more importantly, worthy of my capital. The final 10 minutes, and this is, this is a big mistake people make, they don't ask me for anything. You should ask, uh, what do you want? How much money do you want? How much of the company are you willing to sell? Uh, and on and on. Do you, do, you want, do you want my money only? Do you want me on your board? Do you want you know, how do we, how do, how would we work together for this to turn out to be a good thing? So some do's and don'ts, the do's, uh, you know, slide one is a very important slide. Uh, sometimes people hang on it for 15 or 20 minutes, which is really dumb. You've probably got a 30 or 40 slide pitch. And if you're on 15 minutes on slide one, uh, you're never going to finish. And believe me, people do get up and leave after about 40 minutes if it's not going well. Uh, so time is precious. It's precious to us. It's precious to you. Uh, don't tell a mystery story. So on the first slide, what's your mission and vision? Who are you? Why are you here? Just put it on the table. That way we all know what we're about to get involved with here. But look, this is the age of the internet and a thing called Google, which I'm sure you all know. Research your audience. You should know something about everybody in the room. You should find out in advance who's going to be in the room for the pitch. Uh, first pitch is probably only one person, maybe two. But as you go on and get into various pitches with the partnership, you need to know who's in the room and what makes them tick. A good salesperson, as I was taught back a long time ago, was you, know, you knew everything, including the name of the person's uh, pets uh, when you were calling on someone for sales. And you're doing nothing more than selling is what you're selling your idea and selling yourself. It, you've, you, you should have worked really hard on your strategy of the pitch. Um, you know, you need to rehearse this thing. Uh, it's it's you know, don't, don't just sort of create a bunch of slides and wing it. Uh, that'll be very apparent, especially someone who's seen 10,000 pitches. Uh, I personally want to see a little bit about your financial outcome. A lot of pitches these days as well, you know, we're not going to have any revenues for three or four years. Well, that may be true, but you're going to spend money for the next three or four years. And so how much money are you going to spend? Why are you going to spend it? And so forth. So how, you need to have a financial discussion in addition to the other things. Um, and then at the end, and one of the things that's always useful is like, assume you're successful. We used to call this the glimmer of greatness at Benrock. So assume it's successful, no miracles happen, but good things happen. What does this thing look like five, seven, 10 years from now? What if, if there are proxies in the market that you can call on to say, look, if we're successful, we'll be worth $500 million or, or whatever. It's great, to, it's great to help frame who you are and where you fit in the universe. Some don'ts. Don't forget to ask for the order. I cannot tell you how many times people walked out of the room and I had no clue as to how much money they wanted or what they wanted from me. And that's like a waste of everyone's time. Don't read the slides. The slides should be able to read for themselves. So you're allowed to, you know, expose about the concept on the slide, competition, technology, whatever. Don't read the slides. I can read the slides and you're going to leave a copy behind. So that's fine. You know, um, it's so it's the other thing that happens is sometimes you get about 40 minutes in and you look down and you're only halfway through the pitch. You're in trouble uh, at that point. Uh, so you got to sort of concat it. And the, and the other thing that, that sometimes, and, and it depends on the audience and depends on the people, we'll ask questions in the middle. My preference is answer my question very quickly and succinctly and then get back on your pitch strategy. Uh, because I'm hungry for the answer and I want to know, but, but don't sort of answer the question and then elaborate for 10 minutes. You know, you need to get back on your pitch strategy to get through your story to get to the end. So there are three questions that we at Venrock, and Venrock's a, a storied firm uh, founded in, in the 1930s by Lawrence Rockefeller. Uh, I was around for 400 deals in my 25 years there, of which I did 53, as I said. So we had, we, we sort of, fine tune the exit, uh, of, uh, not the exit, we fine tune the final sort of part of the pitch. And there are three questions we always ask the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur says, take us on a sales call. Well, what does that mean? So who are you calling on? What level are they? What, what permissions do they have? Well, how can they actually write the check? Uh, describe your product to the person you want to buy it. 
uh, describe the competition, describe everything about it, just take me on a sales call. And if you can do that, then you've got a good command of what you're selling and why you're selling it and the passion you may have for it. If you, if you can't do that, then you've probably not done your homework enough yet. The second thing is answer the question, what do you want from the company? Imagine you're successful and the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal writes a story about your company. What do you want that headline to read? That's really important. Do you want to be, you know, do you, you know, is it do you talk about the culture? Do you talk about the impact on climate? Do you talk about the profit you made? What, whatever, just think about what those values are that you want that story to read. And then the final one, and if you get to this question at Venrock, you were doing pretty well. Uh, it was, what do you, the entrepreneur, want from this? Do you want to be rich? Do you want to be famous? Do you want to be rich and famous? Do you want to be known in your community as, you know, the best person ever or whatever? It's just think about what does it mean to you? Doing a startup's hard. There's a lot of risks. And uh, if you, you know, if you don't have the wherewithal to know what you want and be able to draw a picture so you can guide people, guide investors and guide customers, then it, it becomes almost impossible to pull off. Anyway, that's the perfect timing, 810. Uh, that's, that's the art of the pitch. Um, that's it, Christine. Thanks, Ray. I have to say, I'm still working on my headline. You asked me that uh, when I took this game job. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, eventually I'll have an answer for you. Okay, so this is the fun part. This is a great way to start my morning here in California. Um, if I could get Jared to come off or to turn on his camera and um, Leslie Dewan from Crit Criticality Capital, Tom Russert, and Carly Anderson. So these uh, four distinguished folks are our judges. Carly is from Prime Movers Lab. And Tom, forgive me for forgetting your company. I thought I had enough caffeine, but you're on mute, Tom. It's skilled speaking. Skilled speaking. Okay, see, that's funny. Uh, I, I would forget the skilled speaking title. Okay, so the way this is going to work, Jared's going to give his best pitch with all the energy he's He's got here today. Um, judges, we will come back to you in six minutes for feedback. Jared, take it away. Thank you very much, Christine. And thank you all for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you because I don't have any friends who are nuclear scientists, basically except for one. Um, and it got me into the field. I was on Clubhouse about six months ago. I'm an artist, a writer, um, I live in New York City, and I'm connected to a lot of culture here, like the art world and media outlets. And I, I, when I was a kid, I, I was really into robotics and like science and math, and um, I studied computer science in college. And, but then I, I just, I felt like I wanna be free and tell stories and write poems. and. And, but I see climate change happening. I see global warming happening and everyone my age does. And it, it's a burden on me and it hurts me. Like, I'm so angry that we're not solving this, that we're not doing it. And I didn't know that there was an answer until somebody said, hey, you know, nuclear power is actually really clean, really safe. And the advanced nuclear can really make a dent. And so where I heard that first was, as I said, on, on Clubhouse, um, speaking to uh, Dr. Filippone, who, who's developing a, a micro reactor called Hollows. And so I interviewed Dr. Filippone and we started talking and I started learning about nuclear science. And I found out that, you know, the, the science here is beautiful. It's filled with love. And I thought, I wanna help. I want to help solve this problem. So I start talking to people about it. I tell everybody I can, I tell my mom, my dad, my brother, anybody on the street. And you know what is the most amazing thing? I'm sure you guys have experienced this. So much pushback. There's a list of a dozen reasons why we can't do nuclear. And then you, I started looking into the history and in the United States, I look at the last 40 years and I say, where are the new reactors? 
Where are the advanced reactors? Where are the molten salt reactors? Where are the high temperature gas reactors? Where are the micro reactors? Where are the small reactors? There's a lot of designs, there's a lot of science and, and credit to all of you and to the scientists for pushing that. And yet here we are. Um, this is an innovation boot camp. And nuclear science is the most innovative technology I've ever experienced in my lifetime, the, the, the most amazing technology I've ever seen. And yet here we are. The government's pushing billions of dollars into this industry in subsidies. And there's not really, it, it doesn't feel to me at least that, that there's a real urgency from the public to getting this into reality. And I think that's because people are afraid. And so I wanna help to educate people and to tell stories about the research and about you and about how this can actually solve global warming in a big way or not solve it, but contribute to the solution. And so that's podcasts, that's documentaries, that's memes, it's writing, it's art, it's culture. It's a whole discourse around how nuclear went from the, the miracle of nuclear power to the dirtiest word in energy, even when it's the safest and cleanest energy source as we know. So that's my pitch to you. And, and what I'm asking from you is access. I, I want to hear your story. I wanna know what's going on and call me. I have my number here, email me. I have my email here. And uh, I would love to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. And thanks for going first. I know that's not always easy. Um, OK, so I'm not calling on you judges individually. You guys do this all the time. So jump in. What feedback do you have for Jared? How, how can we help him be successful? I'll start. So. Um... First off, thank you for the pitch. And I really, really like and support your mission. I think that's something that needs to be done. Like nuclear is inherently very multidisciplinary. It has so many artistic aspects and it's like so rich there for communication. Um, in terms of your pitch specifically, I think it'd be better to like, to say more concretely what you're doing much earlier on like for me it wasn't until the last minute or last like 30 seconds of the pitch before I realized like okay he's you know arts and communications person he wants to um you know communicate nuclear across a variety of different media so I think just getting to that really early would be crucial and then that would give you more time for the specifics of how of saying okay I want to do this podcast that can reach these types of audiences and things like that and get into those details but um I'll definitely reach out to you because I'm excited to talk with you more about this I would I would echo some of that I would it'd be it'd be great if you had some examples of your capabilities uh, I didn't see the slides come up if you had slides, by the way. Um, but uh, I just wondered about some specific examples. You know, give me something to wrap my head around. Again, one of the one of the things I live for is where can I put this in the universe that I live? So I think that'd be a very helpful, helpful thing here. I think you did a, a wonderful job of telling that story and creating that emotional connection and using emotions. I think um, for those of us who are more quantitative or if you've got you know, financial engineers in the room, it could help to insert a little bit. Some, like I also learned X, Y, Z and drop in like three numerical facts, um, maybe about the amount of waste, maybe about the amount of energy provided by nuclear and what that even better, what that creates in terms of an economic, uh, economic um, yeah. call to action. Uh, but overall, wonderful storytelling, weaving in some elements to um, maybe other audiences that think a little bit differently could make it even stronger. Um, and echoing what Leslie said about getting that getting that ask in uh, early or like letting us know what kind of company we're talking to very early, because this is a really exciting thing that I think is needed. And if I can add one additional piece, I think also getting into more about why you are qualified to do this, like talking in a bit more detail about previous maybe related projects that you've done and like really just showcase your your expertise in this. Technically, from a presentation standpoint, I thought there was a nice tempo to it. There was a bit of 
trailing off at the end of the sentences and kind of uh, getting a bit quiet. The gesturing with your hands sometimes called attention to itself. So you need to be a little bit careful on camera with, with our hands. The vocal variation was very nice. I, I thought your theme was really good, but I, I largely agree with, with everybody that uh, has critiqued you so far that you know zeroing in on two or three points, perhaps a visual aid or two would enrich and deepen the, the concise, credible, compelling story that you're trying to get to. Yeah. Okay, Jared, that, so I have to admit, I got the benefit of seeing Jared's website and some of his work. And um, I think Jared, at least you, you probably got a few phone calls off of this to help you get started. Um, I will say there's a lot of folks in the nuclear community that are, 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 are interested in how we reach beyond the technology, we connect with the emotion. Um, I really feel like however you go forward with this, keep the sincerity and the honesty in your presentation. You were present, you were authentic, you weren't trying to be somebody that you're not. Okay, and I and and I think that that's the thing to preserve through all of this. So yeah, thanks yeah. again. It was it was great to have you here, and um, I know you and I will chat sometime in the next few weeks. And and June, excellent. You're right on cue here. Our next pitch, um, we're going to dive into some technology here. Um, June's going to share some slides. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jun Wan, an associate scientist from the University of Wisconsin. So today I'm very happy here to share my ideas about. Jun, we if you have shared your slides yet, we don't see them. Oh, not yet. I, I will. Oh, share okay. It. All right. I will stop and, and let you run your show. You okay. Yeah, Come I will turn my camera and uh, be closer to the microphone. So um, yeah, I will talk about my ideas. So um, so this idea is about um, building an at home micro reactor. Um, and uh, um, so it seems like it's super small and could be used in community and uh, people can even build it into your house. So the objective of this idea is try to design a super micro reactor that can meet the electrical and heating needs of an average single family home. And it can fit into a home environment and it should be safe, secure and reliable enough. And also it requires minimum maintenance and the monitoring. And also we will do a bunch of validations to test this technology and it has to be environment um, viable. <clears throat> and the first thing I would like to consider is safety. So there are four aspects of safety, including radiation safety, critical safety, accident safety, and physics security. And I list a bunch of the details here to talk about what kind of safety parameters we have considered in the designs. And after that, it also could have to meet the demand from a single home. So um, at I evaluate, it could be something like 10 kilowatts uh, might um, be range from five to 15 kilowatts. And also it has to meet the demand of load falling and thinning exceeds the grid and also using a home battery system. And the design should be small enough, both the head and wise will be less than two meters. And it will be very short enough, no noise, don't disturb the neighbors. And also we will try to use the existing micro reactor designs, the mature technologies. The ideas could be rely on one of the existing North Alamos National Labs uh, design one kilowatt kilopower reactor. And uh, um, 
Follow details, follow reactor fuels. One of the option is U8MO meter fuels, which is, um, could be able to establish and test the design parameters and heavy meter density and with a very good semiconductive performance. And the other option is the um, tracer um, disposed fuels. So which is quite small and quite safe. The colliding of silicon carbon could improve the melting and the failure temperature to over 3000 Kelvin. And the, um, the other important thing we have to consider is the sheeting. So um, we will use some materials as the reactor vessel, the containment, and also um, outside of the building. So it should be some materials has very strong resistance to the neutronics and the radiation. And the one of the design we consider um, could be something like this. We will use B4C and stainless steel and also concrete as the three different layers outside of the reactor. And we will conduct both numerical and experiment to test the performance of the environment to make sure the safety is under control. And uh, uh, the other side of the design is the conversation. So we have uh, three kinds of options. The first one is Tiananmen, which is very popular in the existing nuclear power plants. The efficiency is super higher but it's very large. And the real option is some more electric convertants. It's more cheaper, no noise, super good. And just with low efficiency. So it's also one of the option. And the third one is sterling converters. The uh, efficiency is 25%. And I think it's a balance of the noise and cost. And it's our current option. And uh, uh, the last thing we, we want to consider is the waste heat. So um, beyond the electrical, we can also um, use the waste and heat from the reactor. So we can use the heat uh, to provide heating in winter. And also we uh, use it to heat the water. And also we can use it for cooling. Uh, system and also many different applications such as greenhouse and console and something other things like that. And it's a summary of the design. So first it's uh, around um, 10 kilowatts electrical power and 40 kilowatts thermal power. And we will use the selling the coal and the continued research to the op optimize the fuels. And we will have a very strong shielding system which can uh, go against the neutronics and the gamma shear. And we will consider concrete boundaries and uh, uh, we might use sodium heat pipes as current and use sterling engineers for the system. And so I hope these ideas of the at home reactor could success in the market. And I would like to thanks for my collaborators. Um, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. So judges, uh, June, if you could uh, come bring your camera back up. Perfect. Okay, I know you guys have feedback. Somebody jump in. <laughs> I'd say one of um, so first off, I really like how like out there this is and how different it is from so many of the other like advanced reactor um, pitches. The key things that I'd want to see are more about what your timeline would look like, because it seems like there are a lot of design choices that are open ended. And so I'd want to see more about your pathway for figuring out when you're going to um, make those options more uh, when you're going to lock them down. Um, and then the other piece is a cost estimate, because I suspect that this might be um, pretty expensive. So I'd want to see how that could compare to other options for uh, for electricity in this market. So, um, so um, um, I hope in uh, one or two years, we can finish the concept design and then and get enough funding to conduct a numerical and ex experiment validation in three years. 
and stand out to the market in like seven years. Um, so uh, the construction of single reactor might be expensive, but after the scale production, and, and we um, get a major supply and um, supply chains, we can significantly reduce the cost and uh, meet the demand of the market. June, if I could tag on to one suggestion there, potentially, at this stage, one thing you can do is put in a target cost, right? And that shows that you've looked at the market and you know what the cost needs to be which gives us more confidence that this isn't a science project, this is a business project. Um, so one thing that could be incorporated is it, you know, that. And um, since I'm talking, I'm gonna continue with two other quick points. One is um, love that you thought about the design decisions in a quick pitch. If you wanted, you could just have kind of a spec list like coolant, this power conversion, this. Um, and that way you can spend more time telling like, like, uh, like Ray was saying about the vision about you know in five to ten years how the world magically looks so much better with these home heating devices um that and, and the roadmap like leslie said was the other thing i want to double click on thanks that was a thank you for the pitch it was great okay thank you oh hey june uh it was really really good and and i've wanted one of these things since i was a kid um <laughs> quite seriously uh, another story another time but your, your slide one was fantastic, particularly because you put the point in there about it has to be economical. So many ideas, people will work forever and they really don't get it. So Carly, good for you for bringing that up as well. Sort of, it'd be great to sort of uh, put an envelope about the cost and what, what the risks are in that cost. Um, because if you get it wrong or if you get it right, things could go better, things could go worse. But anyway, I think that, I think that was really important. You uh, also, you had that uh, slide with the Tesla battery. So you, you helped me put this physically in my mind where it might fit. And I, I don't have a Tesla battery, but I see people with them. So I get it. Um, the, the one, you know, the, the, this is a retail product per se. Uh, I might have, uh, I certainly would ask if we were in the first meeting, so how much have you learned about, uh, I don't know, how would I call it, retail safety? Um, you know, uh, local laws and compliance and stuff. For example, here where I live, uh, I went to the town and asked if I could put up a small windmill to generate power and they said no, because um, they don't want to see these things above the trees. Um, anyway, it's sort of have just, no one's gonna say, oh yeah, bring those nuclear reactors on, but at least address that issue because I think that's pretty critical. Anyways, good pitch. Nice job for five minutes. Very good. Thank you. Couple thoughts on the actual science of the presentation. June, I would move back a little bit from your camera. You're, you're really close, not too far back, but you're really close and watch your posture. So that much better that we can, I kind of felt like your face was so close to the camera that it was, that it was um, calling attention to itself. The slides versus speaker notes, my, my feeling about the actual slides where they were a little dense for the amount of time trying to listen to you, you were kind of reading some of the slides. I felt like the re reactor design shielding slide was particularly good. Lot, nice pictures, two or three points were clearly made. And I, I really like that and it's a good example. I think. Uh, a good part of those slides where you could have three or four bullets could be in your speaker notes as a sideline so we can both comprehend what you're what we're hearing and take in also what we're reading the um, as far as vocal variation you have a wonderful rich voice and I'd like you to expand on that 80% uh, of the virtual presentations anymore, more like a radio show. And it's really important that you use your voice and open up your articulation. You're, you have a bit of a, what we call it in the Midwestern world, a tight jaw and you're speaking with a tight jaw. So I would suggest opening up your articulation and slowing down a little bit and adding that vocal variation because what where you're headed with the product uh, with the additional critiques being commented on, 
is, is very interesting. I've seen a lot of these at Berkeley, and this is a fascinating potential product. Thank you. Thank you. I think you probably have an audience full of early adopters, June, to be quite honest with you. Yes. I'd be right, I'd be right in line. I'd, I'd, I'd be looking at what I had to sell to buy what you got. So keep on going. Um, all right, I see Charlene and Hadisa. If you guys, Charlene, will you be making? There we go. You guys are in control. I will go off video. Charlene, you're on mute. Yeah, Charlene, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you now and we can see your screen perfectly. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the portable energy revolution. All around the world, disasters are wiping out access to electricity. In 10 years alone, the US and its Caribbean territories have seen a 600% increase in blackouts due to disasters. So imagine that you are a decision maker in one of these disaster relief organizations. When these disasters occur, renewables are insufficient because they can only supply a small amount of the total demand. So really your only large scale solution is to deploy fossil fuel generators. But these are problematic because they're slow on arrival, can take up to months, they're expensive, require constant refueling, and they contribute to carbon emissions. What's worse is that these fossil fuel technologies are going to be more restrictive in the future because they don't meet international net zero targets. So what other options do we have? Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to introduce you to SUBR technologies, the zero carbon portable marine power station that can provide purified water and electricity to at least 200,000 people. We address the pain points of being faster, cheaper, and aligned with net zero targets. So you see when a disaster occurs, there are two main problems. You have generation and you have transmission. Transmission can be reinstated within a week, but when generation is down, it can take up to years to get back online. We satisfy this need by rapidly deploying to the disaster zone and temporarily providing base load energy until the land systems can be restored. Our technology consists of a PWR small modular reactor on board a ship to provide an ocean-based solution for disaster relief. Now for you non-nuclear people, you're probably wondering, a nuclear reactor on a ship? That's an insane idea. But in fact, did you know that a similar project existed in the 1960s where the US military powered Panama for 10 years using a floating nuclear power plant? Did you also know that there's a new wave of, of nuclear ventures that have already received billions of dollars in private and public funding? And these are land-based, so you can start to imagine the potential for a more flexible solution. And it's already happening. There are two startups that are working on building these, these floating nuclear, nuclear power plants, but they're utilizing a molten salt reactor design, which translates to an extremely long time to market. And what might surprise you even further is that there's a company called Car Power Ship that already has a fleet of marine power ships, but they utilize fossil fuel technology, which again poses problems for international net zero targets. This is the right time for sub R because we combine the best of historic and current nuclear ventures. And we have the right team to do it. So I'm Charlene, Hadiza and I are co-founders and combined we have experience in three different continents on nuclear plant construction, advanced reactor fuel design and sustainable energy systems. And we have a growing team of engineers and communications experts, including a university partner called Polytechnic in France. And to top that off, we also have an agreement with the lead engineers that worked on the Panamanian project in the 60s to refine our technological and our licensing roadmap. In addition to that, we have an amazing board of advisors that are based in the United States and in France. Our strategy is to spearhead the combination of these actors in order to, to deliver a complete package. So our customers then would be disaster relief organizations, government relief agencies, utility companies, and even financial institutions. So an example of what, some examples of what our contracts would look like would be, for example, in 2017, where FEMA had a contract valuing $223 million to rent portable generators from a company called Western, Solution, Western Solutions. 
And even this year in 2021, the South African government uh, issued a contract valuing $15 billion to several companies to produce solutions for emergency electricity generation for disaster relief. So to further put the market into perspective, these nations combined, they budget billions of dollars on disaster relief and then see four times that budget in losses. We are planning to target the share spent on portable energy, which will have a market share or market market value of $40 billion by year 20, by year 2020, by year 2030. With our multi-path revenue options, our customers will have the options of using a contract, unit sale, or subscription for a service. Currently, we are working on um, customer engagement and obtaining letters of interest for future pilot studies. And the next 24 months, we're seeking a seed funding of $1 million to secure industrialization partners to start or pre-licensing -pre stage um, procedure, as well as to gain access commercial um, computational models for our year seven. The idea for Subar came from my childhood where these disaster induced blackouts would leave my family and I in the dark without possible water and with food spoiling in the fridge. That is why we're committed to addressing energy instability because we can't stop disasters, but we can prevent the blackouts they cause. You can be a part of this new energy revolution. The time, is now. Thank you. That's terrific. Charlene. Right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. Uh, well, re uh, and clearly you've well rehearsed that many times. Very good. Well, I understand. So let me get this right. You, by the way, you've covered off the problem, the solution, who's the customer, what the business model might be, and you personalized it at the end there. That was very nice. So. You're going to just assemble technology from other vendors, right? Okay, you're shaking your head. Yeah. So you're kind of an integrator at this point exactly. and then deploy. Okay, got it. How much, how much money do you think? Uh, I, I'm just, it was a very good pitch. I really did cover off all the basics, but do you, do you think this is a, is this like a, a small amount of money, a hundred million, or is it a big amount of money, a billion? uh to, to to integrate one of these ships and oh by oh a little tidbit uh Lawrence Rockefeller actually did this back in the 50s uh with a ship a long time ago uh just talk about trivia so uh is it a is this a big financial problem uh, a big financial commitment by somebody All right so, so generally just typically in nuclear industry the capex is 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 a large upfront cost generally yeah. Sure. But because we're not looking at the your quintessential building of these you know large power plants yeah. on land, we've been able to scale that that construction costs with everything on board the ship, everything assembled, between um, one hundred and fifty and two hundred million to assemble um, one unit with all its parts. So, um, does the price of electricity matter, or is it in an emergency we pay whatever it takes? Um. So. We've calculated that the, the price of electricity for, um, for from the, the sub R unit would be yeah. half of what it would be on like for a quintessential um, reactor. So we value, we estimated that about $3,000 uh, $3, per megawatt. Yeah. Please correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, sorry. So that's the, the, cap, the capex. So the, the capex is three to three, three to three and a half thousand per megawatt. Yeah. But to the levelized cost of the electricity, so that that that's what you pay dollar per megawatt hour. Yeah. We're looking yeah. at anywhere from eighty to one hundred and twenty dollars, um, and and for other portable solutions, it can be okay. considerably more. Um, exactly. you know, two to three times. Yeah, I, I would have I would have put that in the pitch somewhere. The economics here, just but, okay. So I'll let others go. It's our time. Is yeah, yeah. So, that so quick. Was just to, to echo what Ray said, that was fabulous, like super polished. It answered um, just about all of the questions that I would have. Um, you know, the one additional piece that Ray mentioned was including price of electricity and kind of ballpark that against what a truck and diesel generator would cost, for example. Um, I especially liked the slide that said, okay, you know, there is precedent for this because it kind of showed where you are positioned in the market space, talking about historic reactor designs, 
new reactors, um, new ship-based nuclear reactors, advanced nuclear in general. I thought that was very, very helpful and would translate across a broader audience. Um, and yeah, this, this is maybe a finer tuning thing. It could be interesting to bring your personal story more towards the beginning, but it also worked where you had it right now. That's a, that's a finer piece. I, I loved it. That was, that was fascinating and thank you for it. Thank you. Yeah, I think my my three favorite parts were that you like established the directionality at the beginning with this problem is getting worse, that you gave the concrete examples, both in, both in terms of you know, ships that exist, Western solutions, all the things we need to see to say like, oh, this there are companies like this, we can see how it fits together, and the credibility you established on those team slides going through that. I thought that was fantastic and something that a lot of, uh, you know, people can struggle with in this space if they come from one sector, but I, that was just wonderful. One thing you could touch on is the regulatory. Um, that could be just a sentence or two, but other than that, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And actually just to add one additional piece, sorry. Um, yeah, in a, in a second meeting, I would want to dig into more about um, your thoughts on the regulatory pathway, what the applicable regulations are and what you're thinking about for the, the timeline. Absolutely. That space as well. I wasn't sure if there was, uh, I'm trying to remember if there was anything said about the safety aspect of this being out on an ocean in, in this particular configuration that you're talking about. That might have been in the slides, but to me, it, it, it's an important aspect. For anybody watching this today, this was a wonderful example of a presentation. It definitely, as Ray would suggest, would get that, that follow-up meeting. I felt that the, the attention step was really good. And the conclusion uh, that the time is now, you said in the beginning, in the, at the end, in the beginning, you said 600%, you had an attention step. You, you said, imagine these things and you helped us get engaged from the get-go. The use of, I'm sure Puerto Rico, by the way, could really have used this particular uh, design. The, um, the 200,000 people, you, you gave lots of good examples of yeah. disaster relief organizations, government disaster, who could use it. It, it was content rich, but it, it, for some reason, I didn't feel overwhelmed. I thought your graphics were wonderful. In many, many ways, this was an exceptionally good presentation, and I, I think you have a big future. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, so I think we have to um, we have to let a little bit of the secret out that Charlene is a graduate, right, of the Nuclear Innovation Bootcamp. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so for all of you, this is this is what you can be, right, and this is what bootcamp is about. Boot camp virtually this year, Charlene. I absolutely agree. I wanted I wanted to give you this at the end, um, <laughs> um, but I don't know where you are uh, in terms of your company. Um, I'm don't know if you're familiar with the program I run, Gain. But yes. if if we fit in for you, call. Absolutely. And, and that and that offer is open to all of our presenters today. Um, if you want to know more about partnering with the National Labs to push your ideas forward, um, we'd be more than happy to uh, get you connected to the right folks. Thank you Thank again you so, much. so much. That was wonderful. Um, Thank you, Christy. Sure thing. Okay. So, judges, it's after the pitch. Let's say, let's say um, they hated your idea. Do you give up? Do you walk away? How, you know, do you want somebody calling you back if they've if they've addressed your concerns? What do they do? I for, so, for me, you know, there there are a lot of mountains to climb, uh, and um, if if the investor that you're pitching doesn't like it, don't push it. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of places to get the kind of capital you need to do your business. So don't, you know, I just really, I don't push it. Uh, the one thing you might want to keep in mind, and I've used this a lot, is if the investor doesn't get back to you and say, no, thank you, not for us, 
then you should hold that in mind because when other entrepreneurs are checking out investor types, you know, you can just remember, well, this guy kind of, this gal kind of treated me poorly, didn't tell me that I wasn't interested in all that sort of stuff. It's a small world at the end of the day in the entrepreneurial community. And, and uh, uh, I think it's really important to have a proper closure. Right. Carly? Yeah, the two questions I would ask is, what would you need to see to invest, especially if it's going badly? Because you want to make sure you understand why you're not interested in investing. Is it, is it a stage issue? Is it a thesis issue? Is it a personality issue? Um, and that way, if it's a stage or something like that, you can follow up with, uh, do you mind if I keep you in the loop for future updates? And that way. All right. So. Carly, we had you in the middle of the, the last question to ask. Um, so here's the thing, right? This could happen to you too, right? You could, you could get booted out. Don't let it fluster you, right? Get right back in there, pick up where you left off and, and do the best. So Carly, um, let, let's try to finish strong here. Finishing it with, you know, don't push it make sure you understand why if you can get that feedback and also create uh, a, a channel for follow-ups down the road that was my those were my comments on after the pitch if it does not go well and start to okay. open the second yeah. one i got it I, I would like to uh comment about uh managing the q a oftentimes when parts of the pitch may not have gone in the direction that you want them to go in managing the Q&A can become a, a really critical part of it, that you can actually be prepared, anticipate what questions might be asked, which is really important. And also, it, and you might sometimes ask a question just to thought start the activity to encourage the audience to participate. So that these types of elements that always think your uh, the person that the questioner and uh, and sometimes you need to repeat the question depending on the cultural variations in the audience in who's present and so on and how big the audience is oftentimes repeating the question for clarification re reassures the person asking the question that you heard what they said and as as well as uh, the entire audience particularly if you don't have, if you're not mic'd in, in a room. Whoops, sorry, I was talking and I was on mute. Okay, so um, let, let's talk about um, what do you, so as a startup, as, as an entrepreneur, what do I work on first? Do, do I need to spend all my time on the development of the idea? Do, do I focus on finding the right people? Um, or is it just you're doing everything? I mean, <laughs> I, I see by the smiles, it's you're not Great, sleeping and you're doing much. everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Leslie, will, Leslie can vouch for that. Um, look, I think, you know, a, a new idea, and all these were interesting and new ideas in some respect, you, you need credibility. Uh, so you should certainly spend time on identifying the kind of talent you need and, and how much money and what you're going to try to accomplish with it. But, but you need to look for sources of credibility. And that can be customers, that can be other people, that can be research you can cite. Um, uh, you know, the those are those are really important. A lot of a lot of VCs these days won't even fund something without a customer or two. There's still a bunch of us that'll do it without that. We, you know, I did Cloudflare, which was three people in a slide deck, um, but I had a lot of knowledge about where they were headed. So, uh, but it's about credibility. So think about how to establish that and and what you need to bring to the table so that you're credible and the, and the investors will give you the money to give it a shot. That's, that's excellent advice. I think, um, you know, getting, getting that, and that certainly is something that there's a lot of creative different ways to do that. It doesn't necessarily have to uh, come through that first order. Leslie, do you want to remark on maybe, you know, th things you wish you had focused on or, you know, <laughs> how did you, 
So for those of you that don't know, Leslie is, uh, um, I, it doesn't seem right to call you the ex-CEO. We'll say the former <laughs> CEO of Transatomic Power. But um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you split your time up? Absolutely. Um, so, hmm, that's, <laughs> it's a bigger <laughs> question, actually, thinking about, you know, in a, in a company that wrapped up operations now about two and a half years ago, it's certainly a lot of a lot of lessons learned. But I, I think one of the most important things taking a step back is to be able to learn from your mistakes so that you're not making them twice. So figuring out what went wrong, why it went wrong, and doing a really solid analysis, saying like, all right, this this thing failed. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? And like really digging into it as much as possible, I found to be very, very valuable. Excellent. Okay. Um, I don't like to tack on to that. Like, I feel like there's a lot of people in the industry who are having that exact same experience, Leslie, of like, you know, these ideas are not necessarily new. You've got micro reactors on ships from 70 years ago. And so we've got a host of these experiences happening again and again and again. And so it's like, what is at the root of that? And I don't think it's, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. And I'm, that's what I'm curious about. That's, yeah, that's an interesting piece. And just to, um, yeah, I've been thinking about that more, more broadly in the context of the nuclear industry as a whole. So like thinking about not just, you know, mistakes I have made, but also thinking about, you know, what, what did the nuclear industry do wrong or right back in the 1950s and 1960s in the first atomic age? And now as we're all re-entering hopefully the next atomic age, how do we learn from those past actions? How do we make sure that we're not repeating the same mistakes? How do we make sure that we're communicating with the public, that we're designing technology that people want in a manner that's safe and economical and proliferation resistant? Yeah. And I guess, so, so Tom, do you have suggestions for um, how you be effective in the Brady Bunch world we're all living in right now? Where I think for me, when we come out of this, I'm going to be so excited to find out how tall everybody is. <laughs> I've met most of you this way. I have no idea how tall you are. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I really... I really think that the whole subject matter that Jared was uh, directing his thoughts to is really important. Atomic, this whole subject matter is very controversial. And I think every single presenter, everybody that's even touching this field, I, I worked with the, the uh, Berkeley program on this particular um, summit type uh, program uh, four or five years ago. So this is like my third or fourth on, on nuclear alone. And it's a very controversial subject. And I think you have to be prepared to anticipate who's in your audience and what they might be thinking and might be saying. So you're ready for that, that you all of a sudden don't diminish your stature because you hadn't thought of it or, yeah. or blow them off, so to speak, because their, their question's controversial. You have, to be, you have to be prepared for, depending on how you're approaching this. So thanks very much, everyone. We are going to end um, just one minute early because we need you to sign out of this session and sign in to the main boot camp where we're going to start off our day with affectionately who I'm starting to call the other Christine, Christine Savinicki or Christine with a K. Um, and uh, I'm sure everyone will have a wonderful day with the boot camp. There's multiple sessions to join into. And thank you for being here. Thank you for loving the technology that I have loved for so many years. And to our judges, thank you for your valuable time and your insights. Um, I know I took some notes for when I leave my game job and I start to build whatever the heck I'm going to build. <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. Good luck to you all. Happy Thanks, hunting. everyone. Thank you.